I speak to you in the name of the living God, blessed Trinity, and lover of your souls. Amen. Amen. After graduate school, I was working in North Carolina and had just gone through a breakup. It was a bad one, and that I had been cheated on. So my friends made up a ridiculous name to call my ex so that we could talk about it without ever having to say her name again. They called her Susie Arugula. Now what made the breakup so rough was in part that Susie lived on a main road near my work. This meant that to get home each day, I had to drive past her house. And I couldn't help but notice if her car was in the driveway or not, or if she'd picked up the Amazon packages at her door or not. And I didn't mean to notice, usually. But one day at the end of that week, I noticed her front windshield smashed in. Now, you may have guessed by their stellar renaming capabilities that I have some remarkable friends. And I know they love me. So as soon as I saw the broken glass, I called them on three-way and asked, yo, did you just bust up Susie Arugula's windshield? <laughs> and by the sound of their laughter, I was worried I would soon be bailing my friends out of jail. <laughs> but alas, they didn't do it. Turns out a giant oak tree branch did it. And you know how that tree's decision to bust up Susie Arugula's windshield made me feel? So good. <laughs> so good. Right? My friends and I loved it. We did a little victory booty shake on our wee dance party that night. Because for just a brief moment and a rough week, it felt like the universe was on the side of the good guys. We didn't have to take matters into our own hands. Karma, fate, destiny, something bigger than all of us tipped the scales of justice in our favor. Hey, all you Christians in the room, have you ever felt like that? <laughs> felt good because someone who wronged you got what they deserved? I'd take a raise of hands right now, but I worry it might look like the wave at a Guardians game if I did that. That desire for cosmic revenge is just as common to Christians as it is to every other human being on the planet. And it's just as common for contemporary folks like us as it was for the ancient ones. Think about this for a moment. There's only one book from scripture that in its entirety is in our prayer book. What is it? The Psalms. Why is that? Well, I think the Psalms speak to us so deeply because those musicians and artists, they wrote poems and songs that are emotionally real. When they hurt, psalmists ask God to throw a spear through their enemies' hearts. And when they rejoice, their words dance. They feel what they need to feel about whatever's happening, and they're unashamed to let God and everybody else know about it. That's why we use their words to pray. It's part of our prayer book. See, there's a great song that came out in the last decade. I don't know if any of you have heard it by Jaron Lowenstein called Pray For You. It opens with a narrative, <clears throat> not unlike my opening story. He, uh, he's a guy who just went through a breakup. And he goes to church, and he hears the preacher talk about praying for his enemies. And afterwards, he belts out like a psalmist. I pray your brakes go out running down the hill. I pray a flower pot falls from a windowsill and knocks you in the head like I'd like to. <laughs> Wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the prayer of the Psalms, P.S. <laughs> Now, his prayer might sound harsh, but a flower pot isn't as intense as the psalmist's prayers that God breaks someone's arm or teeth or even to dash enemy children against rocks. Ouch. Whew. Thankfully, 
God doesn't usually carry out justice according to our prayer requests. And I don't think that it's God who actually knocked that tree branch into my ex's car. (laughs) But there is a trope in scripture meant to remind us that even if our prayers for justice aren't answered verbatim, God still cares about justice just as much as we do. In fact, our desire for justice comes from God in whose likeness we are made. And I wonder if that's why God liked the psalmist David so much. Scripture says David was someone whom God called friend. That means God might have been dancing to Jaron's song right along with us if David had a bad day. God even asked the prophets of old to remind us with Scripture that justice will always prevail in the end. And the prophets do this through a trope called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. We heard about that day in the reading from Malachi this morning. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi, the prophet, his name means messenger of God. And his prophetic writings focus on foretelling God's justice. Where is the God of justice, he writes. And he asks this and other questions rhetorically in the opening chapters, verse by verse, responding to these questions, pointing his readers to the day of the Lord. When evil will be burnt down to stubble by the God of justice. The imagery used here in Malachi of fire In the Hebrew language, fire is connected to both the words for anger and for judgment. Anger in English is translated from the phrase burning of the nose. Think about that every time you get angry. And judgment, it's from the word meaning to set ablaze. Anger and judgment liken to fire. And this tells me that when we're angry and we're hurt, By evil in this life, God acknowledges that fire burning within us seeking justice is a righteous anger. As long as we can direct that righteous anger and judgment to prayer for the day of the Lord. For God's justice to prevail. Because if we're praying with our anger and our judgment, we're not out there smashing windshields, <laughs> trying to take justice into our own hands. The flower pot prayer is a lot better than becoming known as that flower pot sniper, although it might make a good Netflix series. <laughs> Malachi assures us that only God has the skill to yield fire's judgment justly. It's Malachi who gives us the language of God as the refiner's fire. You've probably heard this before. And a refiner is the same Hebrew word for a goldsmith. God's skillful burning in judgment will not destroy but create. Or as at the end of the day in today's reading from Malachi puts it, the day that comes shall burn. But the sun shall rise with healing in its wings. Now, in Christianity, we don't often think of the day of the Lord as a day of fire, right? We commonly think of it as Sunday. Um, We sing songs like, this is the day that the Lord has made. Not quite the same feel that you get in Jewish tradition. As Christians, we tend to focus on the healing bit. But it's all about the same day. The Jewish day of the Lord and the Christian day of the Lord come from the same tradition. So why are they so different feeling? (laughs) Well, they're two sides of the same proverbial coin. We just each focus our attention on a different part of the day. And it can get confusing in the text because the Christian calendar and the Jewish calendar have different starting points. Our contemporary culture follows the solar calendar, but Judaism follows the lunar calendar. So the Jewish day begins at moonrise, not sunrise. This means that for the Jew, the day of the Lord 
begins in the dark. And it's in that dark moment when we need justice the most that God's fire is sent to light our path. It was a cloud of fire that led Israel by night out of Egypt. And it's the refiner's fire that in the end will lead the way for all humankind to daybreak. Jesus points us to this eternal daybreak in today's gospel reading. He too speaks in that same day of the Lord trope. We heard it in Malachi. We heard it in the psalm. We hear it on Jesus' lips today. And by the end of this chapter in Luke, Jesus promises the coming of the Son of Man at the end of the day, just like Malachi does. But the end of the day is after the sunrise. See, Malachi tells us that the Son of Man who will come is Elijah, but in Christianity, we take Jesus' words to mean the second coming of Christ. So Jesus tells us that if we can endure the darkness of the day of the Lord, by the end of it, we will gain our souls. So in our church calendar, to throw in a third calendar for the day, today is the penultimate Sunday in the season of Pentecost. That means we've got one more. And we gaze through today's window to next week, to the hope of the second coming on Christ the King Sunday. But this week, we have to first acknowledge that judgment will come on the first half of that day. But we can rest assured that when the few cosmic flower pots are tossed around, it's to meet the true need we all have for justice. The day of the Lord will begin with a night that passes through the goldsmith's hearth, where God will burn away all that is wrong and make something precious out of all that is right. The scale of justice will tip forever for the good. And when the sun comes up that day, it will reveal a glistening new world. We will rise on the healing wings of the morning, as Malachi puts it, to the very first full day of the just reign of Christ, our King.